Welcome to the Adelaide Biomed City Mini Review Program. Uh, my name is Andrew Zanatina and I'll be the chair for this session this afternoon. Uh, but before I uh, introduce our first speaker, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting here today on Ghana land uh, and uh, the Ghana people are the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains. Uh, I'd like to pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce uh, our two speakers who are Dr. Rob Bryant and Dr. Hannah Wardle. Um, our first speaker this afternoon is uh, Dr. Hannah Wardle. Uh, Hannah is a, a, an NHMRC CJ Martin Fellow who has recently returned from the Netherlands uh, and now leads the supportive oncology research group at the University of Adelaide and located at Samri. Her research aims to improve the quality of life uh, for people living uh, with or beyond a cancer diagnosis by preventing the physical and psychosocial consequences of treatment. Um, the title of Hannah's presentation is Oncogastroenterology, um, the targeting gut health to avoid side effects of cancer therapy. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Hannah to the screen this afternoon. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I'm really interested in this sort of intersect between gastroenterology and oncology and looking at applying um, some of these approaches to better support people going through cancer treatment. So I think we all know that, that there are both good and bad sides to cancer treatment and all cancer therapies come with some side effect, whether that is present acutely or whether it also persists long after treatment ends. And for a long time, we've recognised the presence of these side effects for some of these traditional chemotherapeutic and radiotherapeutic options for cancer. And this really reflects their inability to differentiate between rapidly dividing tumour cells and the healthy cells that uh, are present within the body. And so this results in a range of, of acute and chronic toxicities. However, we're starting to now appreciate that some of these newer, more targeted agents, even though they have been you know, deemed much more targeted, they are also increasingly recognised for a very complex array of adverse effects. Um, so this is for things like tyrosine kinase inhibitors and immunotherapies. Um, and in both cases, each are poorly prioritised and really considered kind of this, this necessary evil in, in the quest for a cure. But as survival rates increase, it's really important that we um, acknowledge the presence of these side effects. And more importantly, we find ways to better intervene to make sure that um, people are adequately supported throughout their cancer treatment and, and are able to return to their lives um, as happy and healthy as possible. Now, in terms of the side effects that uh, occur from cancer therapies, there are a range, and these can largely fall into the categories of physical, psychosocial, um, and financial. And I'm not gonna go through this exhaustive list, but what I want you to recognize is that it's much more than just the typical nausea, vomiting, and hair loss that we see. These are complex, and most importantly, these are very much intertwined. So if we take the example of diarrhea, this seems fairly benign when you think about it in isolation. But when you think about this person having diarrhea for weeks or months on end, you can appreciate that this would have a significant impact on their ability to leave the house, which would have impacts on their psychosocial well-being, perhaps have financial implications due to their inability to return to work. And so it's really important that we appreciate how these side effects not only occur, but how they intertwine with one another. However, unfortunately, what we know about supportive care at the moment is that it's very siloed. And what I mean by siloed is that, you know, we have people working here who look at neurological complications of treatment. We have other people who are interested in nausea and vomiting, people who look at oral mucositis and mouth complications, and people that look at diarrhea and constipation. And largely, these people work within their own silos, and they very rarely talk to each other. And this is a very problematic approach, I think, because what it results in is quite fragmented care or kind of tunnel vision where one side effect is treated in isolation. And this quite clearly results in significant polypharmacy where people are taking many concurrent medications. And in fact, 88% of people with advanced cancer qualify for polypharmacy. And we know that this has an increased risk of drug-drug interactions, hospitalisation and death. But most importantly, this approach completely ignores a very strong and growing body of data that shows that many symptoms often cluster together. And this very much suggests that there are commonalities in their underlying biology. 
Now, in terms of my interest and that being the gastrointestinal microenvironment and gastroenterology, I think that there is a really important role for gut health and its relevance to supportive cancer care. And I think we can appreciate this by just simply looking at the vast variety of um, functions that the gut, so when I talk about the microenvironment, I mean the mucosa and the resident microbes in the gut, what these factors are able to control. We know that they are important in nutrient absorption, that is the most fundamental role of the gut. They form a physical barrier. They, con they contribute and control immunological function. We know that there are impacts on circadian rhythm, hormonal control, cardiac function, brain function and mood, and drug metabolism. And so for me, immediately, I can see so many examples or applications for how the gut may be implicated in some of these complications of cancer treatment that I've previously described. And this is really important as well because the gut is highly vulnerable to injury. It's one of the most rapidly dividing cell populations in the body. And so it's highly sensitive to acute cytotoxic damage from systemically administered cytotoxic compounds. So what we see is that we have acute damage to our rapidly dividing epithelial cells that line the gut. This causes oxidative stress. We see significant mucosal inflammation. And this results in complete destruction of the mucosal barrier within the gut. So histologically, it looks a little bit like this. Um, so you can see on the right hand side, we have got um, sort of, this is the colon in a rat that's been treated with a high dose of melphalan. We can see areas of frank ulceration and, and near perforation when we look at this histologically. But on a, on a more uh, common scale, I, I suppose, we see characteristics in the intestinal um, microenvironment in terms of villus blunting. So we get complete destruction and loss of the villus and crypt structure. And we also see this within the colon as well. And this typically happens within sort of three to five days after administration of chemotherapy. And we call this mucosal barrier injury, and it's typically indicated by the biomarker of plasma citrulline, which is an enterocyte um, amino acid, and it's able to be measured in plasma, and it is very well correlated with the clinical phenotype of, um, of mucosal barrier injury. However, what we also know about mucosal injury is that it does create a very hostile environment for the resident gut bacteria or the gut microbiome. And so when we think about the gut microbiome, it's all about being this healthy and diverse ecosystem like a rainforest. But what we know after cancer therapy is that it tends to look a little bit like this, where it's completely depleted of its, of its um, species. So it, it does decrease in its overall richness. But what we also see, just like we see, you know, cactuses dominating a desert landscape, we start to see um, organisms that have evolved to be able to cope with these stressful environments. They tend to dominate the luminal environment of the gut after chemotherapy. And so what we see is enteric pathogens like Enterococcus and E. coli dominating the microbial landscape. And, and this is a really significant factor in actually predicting some uh, of these acute and chronic side effects of treatment. So what we know is that mucosal barrier injury and microbial disruption are actually increasingly recognised to be associated with a range of complications of cancer treatment. So we know that they're associated with diarrhoea and constipation, infection and fever, graft versus host disease, which is a complication of stem cell transplantation, uh, cognitive dysfunction, cardiac toxicity, peripheral neuropathy, fatigue and sleep changes, changes in body weight and anxiety and depression. And I think that this really does reflect that list of factors and functions that I previously explained that the gut is so important in regulating. And so my group is really interested and is actively pursuing interventions that are targeting the gut microbiome and the mucosal barrier with the goal of controlling multiple side effects concurrently. We want to minimize that polypharmacy and we want to do this by supporting the gastrointestinal microenvironment. So I wanted to give the example or one example of this for today's presentation, which is targeting the mucosal barrier. And we decided to do this with the IL-1 receptor antagonist Anakinra, because we know um, IL-1 beta signaling is critical in the potentiation of mucosal injury. So we looked at this um, in both a phase 2A um, safety trial and also in a preclinical model where we looked at efficacy. And this model used high-dose melphalan to induce mucosal barrier injury. 
We also looked at a range of um, outcomes, including weight loss, food intake, microbiome composition, and the uh, occurrence of fever. So we've got um, on the right-hand side here, plasma citrulline and body weight uh, changes up the top uh, two graphs. And we can see that the plasma citrulline, whilst we did still see a reduction in the levels of citrulline um, in our melphalan and anakinra group, this was significantly reduced in our anakinra group. So this very much indicated that by controlling mucosal inflammation, we were able to strengthen or minimize the intensity of mucosal injury. This had a significant impact on the weight loss of these animals, where our animals really didn't lose any weight at all. They certainly plateaued in their body weight, but they didn't decrease as much as the melphalan alone. And of course, this also helped our animals maintain their food intake. Again, we're not expecting to completely abolish the effects of chemotherapy. We're hoping to have a substantial impact on the severity and the depth and duration of these symptoms. And we were able to achieve that using anakinra. What we also found that was by supporting the mucosal barrier and supporting mucosal integrity, we're able to stabilize the composition of the microbiome. So this is the microbiome composition shown in um, uh, relative abundance at the taxonomic level of class. And we can see that on day seven, which is where we actually saw some examples of bloodstream infection in our animals, we saw um, an expansion in the enterococcus uh, group. Um, so we can see here that we have an expansion and this was significantly attenuated in our anakinra and melphalan animals. If we then also look at the composition of the microbiome, we can see that there were significant um, shifts in its composition with anakinra helping to maintain the levels of a commensal bacterium called Faecali baculum, which is well um, established to be quite an important commensal microbe in maintaining gut health. And it's also been implicated in a range of other sort of pro-health factors as well. But most importantly, we looked at body, uh, body temperature in these animals as well, using a subcutaneous transponder. And we saw two peaks in body temperature throughout our experimental time course, where we saw an acute peak and a chronic peak, or not a chronic peak, but a later peak. And this later one was associated with the incidence of bloodstream infection. And what we were able to show was that if we gave our animals anakinra with our melphalan, we didn't see this spike in body temperature on day six and seven after melphalan. So this was really important because it's a surrogate marker of infection. So to finish up, um, the conclusions and take home messages of this presentation, albeit very short, is hopefully that you, you've taken away that damage to both the mucosa and the microbes of the gut are associated with local and systemic consequences of cancer treatment. And so supporting the gastrointestinal microenvironment could help control multiple symptoms and break down any silos that we have in our approach to supportive care. We also now know that mucosal directed interventions hold promise in supporting gastrointestinal microenvironment. And we're now looking at anakinra under phase 2B trial, which is being conducted in the Netherlands. So with that said, I would like to thank everyone for their support in, in conducting this research and throw it over to you for some questions. Thanks so much, uh, Hannah, that was fascinating. Um, Hannah, I, look, there's so many questions and uh, given the, the amount of time that we have, unfortunately, I, I, don't, I can't ask all the questions that I do have, so I'll have to take them offline. But Absolutely. I do, do want to ask a couple of things about um, the fact that obviously your metagenomics demonstrates a, you know, a, a significant benefit with uh, anakinra treatment. Um, but the question I've got really relates to um, how do we, um, uh, what understanding do we have around the, the sort of complexity of the microbiome um, it, it, between healthy individuals? Do we know? Do, do we have a sense of that from from studies to date? So, when you say complexity, do you mean sort of the, the differences in people's microbiome? Yeah. So the different yeah. class. So yeah. the different classes. So do we see a, sort of a representation of those different classes in a normalised way across healthy individuals, or is it very different across females, males, or is it different between different ethnicities, or, or you know, depend on the on the actual um, your diet, for example? Do you, can yeah. you have a sense really of that? Really good question. Um, yes, there's absolutely differences. I mean, the microbiome is considered to be as unique as our fingerprint. And so, you know, this reflects the cumulative impacts of, of almost everything in our environment, including as well as our genetics. So yes, there is quite a significant degree of natural variation. Yeah, fascinating. And just one other thing, I mean, the global probiotic industry is sort of tipped to sort of approach $70 billion um, by 2023. 
I, look, to my understanding, probiotics are a relatively small number of different bacterial strains that are actually grown up and then provided to, to individuals. Yeah, and But is there any evidence really that they do serve, a, serve, serve benefit and could they, in the context of cancer therapy, actually provide a sort of prehabilitative effect to the gut? Um, we did a meta-analysis a little while ago on probiotics and found that actually there was no evidence to suggest their benefit. Um, however, this did also, this was slightly undermined by the variation in the field, different probiotics okay. used in a range of cohorts. Um, but I think my challenge with probiotics or my, my gripe with probiotics is the generic nature of them. We, we pluck one off the shelf and we hope that it works. But I think what we need to do is get a better understanding of which microbes are associated with preferable outcomes and then look to harness those. Thank you, Hannah. And I have one question from Rob Bryant. And it actually says, hi, Hannah, immunosuppressive risk associated with anakinra. Yeah, great question. Um, that was the main reason that we did the phase 2A um, safety trial as well. Um, we were we recognised that risk, um, but we saw no, no adverse events on top of the, the typical adverse events of stem cell transplantation in this cohort, and they were able to tolerate the maximum tolerated or the maximum dose of the study, which was 300 milligrams per day. So it was all good. But yes, it was a risk that we wanted to address. Anna, thanks so much for your presentation. It's been really fascinating to, to hear about the work that you're doing and uh, I wish you luck in the future. Um, and that uh, leads me to an opportunity to introduce our second speaker for this afternoon. Um, and many of you would know Rob Bright and the wonderful work that he's doing uh, as a head of gastro, sorry, head of inflammatory bowel disease in the Department of Gastroenterology at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Um, also, just as a means of, of giving you a bit of an understanding of his background, he did his clinical fellowship in inflammatory bowel disease at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, and he completed a Master of Sciences by Research at the University of Oxford in the field of genetics and mucosal immunobiology, or immuno, immunology, I should say, in, in, uh, in IBD. Um, he also was awarded Dean's Commendation for Doctoral Thesis Excellence for his PhD, which he completed at the University of Adelaide uh, just a couple of years ago, actually, in 2018. So uh, as a new PhD graduate, his contribution to the field has, has been enormous. Um, Rob is actively involved in research, exploring uh, treatment strategies involving manipulation of the microbiome in, in, uh, in IBD, both through diet and fecal microbial transplantation. And as many of you would know, um, he's involved in the, uh, in, uh, the Biome Bank, uh, a, um, a company established here in Adelaide, um, looking at providing fecal microbiota transplantation for people with a range of different diseases. Today, his title of his presentation is Microbial Manipulation in Inflammatory Bowel Disease. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome Rob to the screen. Thank you very much for the um, introduction, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. My talk is on microbial manipulation in inflammatory bowel disease. These are my disclosures. A complex microbial ecosystem, um, the so-named gut microbiota, and this has co-evolved with us as humans for millions of years. On a cellular level, the gut microbiome is um, uh, perhaps makes up three times as many cells as our own human cells. And on a genetic level, there is at least a hundredfold as much genetic material in your gut microbiome as in your own person. We are thus super hosts and um, the gut microbiome um, fulfills many important functions for us, including um, priming our immune system and educating it. Um, it, it, it obviously is important for digestion. Um, as well as maintaining mucosa barrier, barrier function. Western lifestyle has led to a significant reduction in gut microbial diversity. We are verging on um, critical extinction of particular gut organisms, and this can be paralleled with um, environmental havoc currently being wreaked across the world. Um, Particular environmental factors implicated include um, a widespread adoption of a Western diet, high in saturated fat, as well as refined sugar, um, widespread use of antibiotic therapy, as well as changes in hygiene over the years. Concurrently, we now see that we're in the grips of an inflammatory bowel disease pandemic. Since the 1990s, we've seen a trebling in the incidence and prevalence of inflammatory bowel disease, both in developed and developing countries. Australia has some of the highest rates in the world, and currently we sit at about 100 and 200, one in 250 Australians having inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease is an umbrella term for both ulcerative colitis as well as Crohn's disease. And these are lifelong chronic inflammatory disorders which affect the GI tract 
and beyond. And we can see pictures here of the skin, as well as the eyes, joints and the liver. It is relapsing and remitting in nature. And unfortunately, without medical cure, we see high rates of surgery, loss of quality of life and disability. So why consider microbial therapies for IBD? Well, we know that the gut microbes are involved in pathogenesis. There is a well-described dysbiosis or abnormal composition and function of the gut microbiota in IBD. Unfortunately, our current medical therapies for IBD target the mucosal immune system. Um, and these often have a significant side effect profile and incomplete efficacy. So let's begin with perhaps the most blunderbust vehicle of microbial manipulation, and this is fecal microbiota transplantation, or FMT. FMT is the process of transferring healthy donor stool into the bowel of someone with a disease for the purpose of fixing that disease. FMT was first described in inflammatory bowel disease in 1989 by one Justin D. Bennett. And this was a short excerpt from The Lancet when he described self-administration of an FMT enema, which led to resolution um, and long-standing clinical remission from his refractory ulcerative colitis. Since that time, um, Sam Costello's study is one of four randomized control trials, which now show induction of remission over six to 12 weeks with the use of fecal microbiota transplantation for mild to moderate ulcerative colitis. For those not familiar with the area, perhaps 30% might look modest for donor FMT as compared to autologous FMT. And this was a consistent result across the trials. But when we put this in the spectrum of our currently available biological therapies, we see that FMT is highly efficacious for emission induction with a similar gain over placebo to these very expensive biological therapies. Beyond crude FMT delivered as whole stool, we are now entering um, a phase of optimized FMT in the form of crapsules. This is a term for lyophilized FMT, which is freeze dried. A recent Australian trial conducted in Sydney, the Lotus study showed us these oral lyophilized FMT um, primed using selected donors without particular organisms thought to be harmful for IBD with antibiotic pretreatment in the form of a combination regimen to create a niche for the transplanted organisms showed an in remission induction effect in ulcerative colitis as good as anything else in the literature at 50%. Further trials are to come in this area. But where are we heading with FMT? There is variability with it. Whilst there are no safety concerns, it certainly is a difficult therapy to regulate. So broadly, we are moving towards second generation therapies and beyond. The first of these is ethanol treated donor FMT. Um, this leaves us with just spores and these spores are stable at room temperature, which make them an ideal drug. Of provisional data, again with vancomycin preconditioning, shows us that spore-based therapies are again effective for emission induction in ulcerative colitis. I think the field is really heading towards more rational microbial therapy. And this involves reverse engineering of defined bacteria down to strain level. The mechanism by which um, this is undertaken is using FMT as a crude vehicle to understand clinical efficacy compared with particular organisms which are mediating a beneficial clinical effect. Those organisms are then selected out, cultured either in a bioreactor or um, using a, um, a standard scaffold to create a, um, a rational microbial product um, specific for an indication. This work has been made possible by rapid evolution in culturing techniques over the last five years. Sam Forster, who now works with Biombank in Cambridge, published this um, seminal nature uh, paper describing culturing of uncult previously uncultural organisms. He went further to describe pairing of these culture-based techniques with metagenomics, which allows us to identify subspecies level um, of, of bacteria. This is really important as similar, rather than identifying mammals, if we compare it to the animal world, we can separate a, um, a koala from a kangaroo, which you can see is certainly important, particularly when we're talking about creating drug products as rational therapies. So the future is bright for FMT and second generation therapies, but how about something perhaps even simpler or seemingly simpler, dietary therapy and inflammatory bowel disease. 
For more than 50 years, dietary therapies have tried and failed. And unfortunately, this has led us, in, led us to an environment where current evidence and recommendations are conflicting. They're often on the internet and patient targeted and non-nutritionally sound. Thankfully, we're getting more evidence coming through over recent years. The premise is, is that diet is a key determinant of your gut microbial enterotype. The pin-up child of dietary therapy and inflammatory bowel disease is exclusive enteral nutrition. This involves use of liquid nutritional formulas alone without um, intake of table food or fluids. EEN is a remarkable therapy and um, induces remission in more than two thirds of patients with active disease, can ameliorate complicated disease, improve nutritional status, and all this without the use of immunosuppression. We don't really know how EEN works is the simple summary. We think it starves bacteria of dietary substrate um, and therein by diminishing bacterial density may lead to restoration of the um, uh, mucus and, and um, uh, uh, gut mucosal barrier. Um, it will also diminish the prevalence of pathobionts, which are resident microbes with pathogenic potential. But while it does those things, it also does what seems to be harmful. And this is the paradox. It decreases diversity as well as the abundance of protective species. It seems that exclusion of table foods is what counts. EEN is unpalatable and therefore recent efforts have focused on other dietary strategies. The most publicized of these is the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, which relies on increased dietary resistant starch coupled with reduced fat, as well as diminished intake of protein and processed food. When trialed versus EEN in a small pediatric cohort, we saw that the Crohn's disease exclusion diet was understandably more tolerable. It also had um, a better remission induction profile than um, standard EEN. There were microbial changes similar to EEN and further work is being undertaken on this Crohn's disease exclusion diet. Diets for ulcerative colitis have been less successful than those for Crohn's disease, but this is a major topic of our work at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in collaboration with our partners in Melbourne. There is a um, diet being trialled called the Foreshore diet, which again has a reduced protein load, reduced sulphur, um, no food additives and increased fermentable fibres. And our pilot study to date has shown this to be tolerable and effective. And we're just starting recruiting for our randomised trial this month. I'd like to leave you with a tantalising slide, which is the combination of FMT with dietary therapy. We've only trialled this in a small number of cases, um, although we have uh, plans for larger trials, but in refractory and severe patients, we have found that FMT combined with a defined dietary strategy, the foreshore diet, has led to quite a remarkable resolution of clinical and endoscopic inflammation, which has been shown to be durable out to six months, even beyond the graph shown. Moreover, we've shown that the changes in the gut microbiota profile have adopted, have changed towards those of the donor profile. And this has, um, we have observed sustained engraftment with the ongoing use of dietary therapy. So this is certainly an exciting direction. So to summarize, gut microbiome is critical to human health. IBD is associated with dysbiosis and microbial manipulation holds promise as an effective therapy for IBD. We currently have FMT and we're looking towards these optimized second generation rational design therapies and dietary therapy is also going to be a mainstay for this area. I'd like to leave you a picture with young Albie who is certainly working on his microbiome at the moment. Thank you. Thanks so much Rob, that uh, fantastic presentation and uh, young Albie looks like he's got probably more food on his face than he does in his gut at the moment. So, uh, <laughs> good on him, good on him, it's exactly the way he should be in, as a child. Um, look, terrific, thank you so much for a presentation that was, it was um, really fascinating from the perspective that you're now seeing the use of um, uh, of FMT in, in, in areas beyond um, the costly and difficile um, uh, treatment, which is clearly a very effective treatment for that. And I was pro I promised myself before to recognise that I was going to be um, chairing a session on on poo that I was not going to make any any jokes. But you started the you started the first, with the first gag of uh, the idea that we'll be able to take um, oral microbiota using a crapsule, I think you called it, uh, which is a great, <laughs> yeah. a great name. 
<laughs> Can I have a sense of what sort of, you know, how often do you have to take a, a crapsule in a, in, a, in a therapeutic context? I mean, is this a daily oh, a good question. crapsule? <laughs> yeah. I mean, currently we use so the existing trials, both predominantly most of those for Clostridium difficile infection, as you've mentioned, that's been the mainstay. Yeah. Um, and the primary indication for FMT therapy. The existing four randomized trials have used syringe-based or you know, crude um, donor fecal microbiota transplantation. So uh, technique, that is, um, it is mixed with uh, glycerol and saline into a mix. But freeze drying takes down the volume of stool significantly. Um, yeah. And so the, tap the, the, the volume of stool per um, crapsule is highly variable, but we are talking a number of these, um, of these tablets each day um, to have the similar volume of bugs and the density of bugs to mediate the effect of um, FMT. So that volume can be variable depending on how we process it, but perhaps somewhere between five and 20 per day. Right. Uh in terms and of the, right, she just made a comment. It yeah. can be up to forty, but technologies right. <laughs> Indeed, just yeah. just uh, just as a as a means of a follow up. Clearly, clearly, with with the FMT that is currently available for a treatment of of, of C, C difficile infection, yeah. I mean, you're actually taking a, a, a stool sample from from a healthy individual, and um, it's not obviously without its risks, just because you know while. Um, you know, the, the, the individual may be healthy, the, the stool itself may be quite healthy, but there may be evidence or existence of, of, um, uh, of, of pathogenic species of bacteria in that stool. How do you control for that? How do you test for it? And how do you then uh, select a, a stool sample that is then used clinically? You're right, Andrew. And this has been one of the big, we've known for a long, more than 10 years, people have known that FMT is efficacious for a current and refractory C, C. diff infection. From the regulatory standpoint, it's been how do we standardize this product and make it safe? To begin with, current data shows that FMT is actually extraordinarily safe. Um, there are very few recorded severe adverse events, most of which have actually been related to the route of administration. So upper GI delivery and aspiration has been an issue in the past. Um, I suppose with regulation has become more stringent criteria as to donor selection and screening. So Biome Bank as a, um, as a, as a, a registered stool bank undertakes very stringent and robust screening protocols. Only 3% of applicants, uh, donor applicants are accepted. They undergo an initial physician questionnaire from everything from past medical history, recent exposures, current history. They then undertake a full screening panel, including stool and blood tests. The stool um, is then collected over a period of um, uh, at 90 days. And during that time, um, it is quarantined until there is a second screening phase prior to release of stool. So that is the level of stringency. So with um, there were, however, you're right, reports of um, uh, injury and even death related to extended spectrum uh, ESBL beta lactamase producing organisms associated with FMT, but this was in a stool bank that was undertaking less stringent screening of their stool. So there are risks, but we, we certainly minimise them. Yeah, look, and just one final question, because I'm conscious of the time, but uh, one thing that I was really curious to see that you, you're actually, you're, one of your clear endeavours is to essentially look at uh, um, next uh, phase or next stage microbial therapies, which will rely on a very clear understanding of the composition of the microbiota that you're going to be using clinically. Um, you know, the complexity and, the, and the, the number of different bacterial species that are within um, our, our gastrointestinal tract, it, it does lend to a, 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 bit, a bit of fear on my part to know that how in goodness name can you actually derive, you know, a, a therapeutic product from such a complex, complex Look, array of bacteria? It is an overwhelming, like when you discuss it in detail, and I suppose we're only in the sort of, with our understanding of the gut microbiota is burgeoning. You know, we're in that zone at the moment. Um, there are studies which show perhaps it's the gut microbial milieu or the me metabolites that could be mediating the clinical effects. So if you're, we know that the crude vehicle of FMT works, but what specifically in that that is working is the subject of this science. Moreover, these um, sort of rational microbial therapies, 
it relies on a defined consortia, which is a colony. So you're putting these organisms together and how stable is that structure going to be? How are they going to interact? And how are they then going to interact with an established microbiota as well as um, the immune system which uh, in which that sort of homeostatic system relies? So there is uncertainty. Um, the two key tools that we're moving forward with at the moment is a bioreactor. So this is an artificial means of generating a stable defined consortia of bugs, which can then be used to self-perpetuate um, an FMT product, which is standardized without having the variability of donors. The second one is using a scaffold. So you get a group of organisms that we know grow stably and we add extra organisms in that then can um, uh, create a, a sustainable culture, um, rationally designed therapy. But it certainly is um, a very complex area. <laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks so much, Rob. Look, I'd like to thank both our speakers today, Hannah Wardle and Rob Bright, for fascinating discussions uh, and of an area that, that um, is, uh, I guess, uh, has potential to affect us all. Our, our gut is, seems to be have its own mind at times, and uh, I think uh, the, uh, in, in the sense that we now have a, uh, a very complex interplay between a bacterial microbiota and, and, and uh, our, 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 the individual self that plays a critical determinant of your well-being um, as, you, as you go through life. So look, thank you for that fascinating presentation. Uh, before we close off, I just want to remind people that these mini reviews are actually recorded and are available on the ABMC website. So if you go to the ABMC website, which is www.adelaidebiomedcity.com, uh, or one word, uh, under the banner webinars, you'll find this and past webinar recordings. I'd encourage people um, to remind your colleagues that uh, these webcasts uh, are live on uh, Tuesday afternoons at 4.30. And uh, we'd love for you to uh, join in in reminding people to build the awareness of these mini reviews because it's a really great way of sharing what the incredible research that's going on here in the Adelaide Biomed City. So um, again, thank you to our speakers today and uh, please join us next week at the same time and same bat channel um, for more fantastic research and science. Thanks. <laughs>